Welcome back, everybody, to Let's Talk Toku. I'm your host, Squall Charleston, and we have another awesome episode for you today with our guest, Melissa Flores. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is going to be a fun episode. We've had a lot of Power Ranger alumni, people that have worked, you know, from when the show started in the middle. Awesome. And now towards the end of season one, we're getting a lot of the people that have been, you know, recently involved with the newer seasons through Saban and into the Hasbro era. Cool. So you're kind of taking it from the beginning all the way to the Hasbro era. That's cool. Yeah, it's funny how it kind of worked out that way. Who would you guys have so far? Uh, we've had Jason Narvi. We had uh, Karen Ashley. We love her. Yeah. Just had Koichi Sakamoto, who's been a huge Amazing. part of the success yeah. of Power Rangers over the years, who pretty much since Mighty Morphin season two or three to RPM, you know, he's the action man. Yeah. Yeah. And now we got yourself and we're going to have another guest um, coming up here soon that I'm super excited for this episode and that episode. It's going to be so much fun for anybody who may be watching who isn't, you know, as up to date with a lot of people that work behind the scenes, which it happens if you're not usually the one in spandex, you know, yeah. a lot of people who aren't super mega fans or who aren't super plugged into the fandom. Uh, could you explain what you've done on the shows, what you've done with Power Rangers uh, for your career? Absolutely. Yeah, um, I was with Power Rangers for a little over 10 years, I think. Um, I started working in 2010, so back when Saban Brands became a thing and uh, Mr. Saban bought Power Rangers back from Disney is when I started working on the brand. Um, I started as a coordinator, worked my way up to director, and essentially I was a Power Rangers TV brand feature. Ex I mean, my title by the end of it was director uh, development and production for Power Rangers. But essentially all that means is that if there was a story, um, be it in comics, TVs, features, digital, shorts, publishing, whatever, um, chances are somebody on my team, if not myself, um, then the coordinator at the time or my boss, Brian Casentini in my department had something to do with it. Um, we were the ones that were making sure that the continuity was correct, um, not always successful, but tried that the, um, the franchise itself was doing good. That was at Saban. Hasbro, uh, obviously changed a little bit, but that's essentially what I did. So I was able to get involved in some really cool stuff. I worked, um, on the TV show, not as much in the early days, obviously, as in the later days. I worked, um, on the 2017 feature, which I'm really proud of. I worked, uh, very closely with the comic book people with Boom Studios and those lovely people over there. We worked on video games, so we did Legacy Wars, Battle for the Grid, Power Rangers All-Stars. We did publishing, so we did the Visual Arts Encyclopedia. I was able to do Hyperforce. We did Meower Rangers, just a lot of crazy, really fun stuff. If it had a story with Power Rangers that was for a little bit of an older audience, so not like the kid books, chances are we were working on it. Dang, that's so much. Like the boon of Power Rangers coming back with Saban on Nickelodeon and kind of everything that culminated to like these last few years of like everything you just listed. Like there's so much, there's so much to Rangers now. Yeah, it's actually something that um, I'm really proud of because definitely when Disney acquired the franchise, it definitely it felt a little bit, and I don't know, I don't know, I wasn't at Disney. It felt a little bit to me, a little bit like an afterthought. Like we acquired all these amazing brands and look, Power Rangers is one of them. And this was at a time that was pre-Star Wars, pre-Marvel. I don't think they really quite knew what to do with, with these guys. So um, that gave a lot of creative freedom, I think, because you had some amazing seasons that come out of Disney. Some of my favorite seasons are Disney seasons, but I also think that um, it was also a lot of, okay, we don't know what else to do. So by the time RPM came around, which creatively was a beautiful, beautiful season, not a lot of Bibles were on it anymore. So I think giving it a new owner and being able to reboot the franchise um, with people behind it who were just as passionate about the franchise as the people back in 1995 really did help, I think, to give... Um, new eyes and new breath and new avenues. And we really had some amazing licensees that jumped on board as well and really truly gave it their, their all. And I think it was just a lot of teamwork and a lot of passion that really helped. And by the time that we left, um, I had an interview with with the author of the visual history. And I said, like, right now, it feels to me like there's never been a better time to be a Ranger fan. And I do believe that. Um, because there's a lot of ways to interact with the brand that you weren't able to do before, before it was just a TV show. I think uh, Koichi, a couple episodes ago, he he kind of put a good pin in it that moving everything Disney era to New Zealand, of course, Power Rangers, you know, outside of Mighty Morphin wasn't really aired over there. And so 
the the brand recognizes like over here everyone could see and know what power rangers is because it's been you know continuously strong and everything but over there it's it's kind of like oh this is still going on and i feel like sometimes if you ask a couple people you know like five ten years ago about power rangers they're like oh i didn't know that was still on but now it's yeah. so prevalent it's almost everywhere it's impossible not to know that it's still on now yeah, I mean, to be fair, that was that was me when I started <laughs> with Saban Brands. I I was a little too old for Power Rangers, like one or two years. So I knew I was aware of Power Rangers when I when it first came out, but it was not something I was buying toys for, or like obsessed with. I watched. I remember watching a couple episodes and being like, "Oh, that guy's cute. That girl's cute," you know. But um, when I came back on board, I, I was like, "Oh, wait, Power Rangers is a thing still." Okay all right, let me, you know, I remember liking it. Let me figure it out. And so it really was like the crash course from hell, like having to learn, oh, wait, there's, you know, at the time there's, there's 18 seasons, there's different costs. Okay. Okay. And so it took six months of really just diving deep before I was able to be like, okay, I really know this brand. Let's go back a little bit. When you first got introduced to the brand to kind of working with Power Rangers hand in hand, um, how did that all come about? Um, so I started out as a current development executive assistant for FX and for and then to HBO. Uh, what I originally wanted to do was write. Um, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a producer. I didn't know if I wanted to be a TV channel executive. Um, it felt to me very, and I, there's love, I've met amazing people working there and this is absolutely not everybody. It felt very rat racy. Um, a lot of, a lot of just trying to get on top of each other to get the next promotion. That wasn't really what I wanted to do. I wanted to focus on being creative. Um, but at the time it was also that first writer strike. So I remember getting really close to a couple of shows, trying to get on as a writer's assistant. I think the first one was um, Prison Break. It was me and a guy, and they went with the guy <laughs> because um, it was an all-male writer's room and they didn't want to make me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> It was it was that kind of stuff. So it was starting to get really frustrating. And so what I ended up doing is like, you know what? I'm just going to take a break from this whole thing. I'm just going to get a job as an assistant for a finance executive because then I could write all day and get paid three times more, work less hours, it'll be fine. But before you knew it, three years had passed and I had written plenty of stuff, but um, I had been so busy with work, I hadn't really done anything with it. And so that happened to be Saban Capital Group. So I was working for Mr. Saban, I was working for one of his directors, and um, thankfully I had made an impression at the time. And uh, so I talked to the general counsel there, who was this amazing woman named Naveen. Uh, uh, and uh, I asked her, I didn't ask her, I told her, I was like, hey, look, I'm getting pretty bored. I miss the industry. I'm going to go back. And she's like, well, you know, we may have a job for you. And she set me up on an interview with Brian Casentini, who had just started as the head of production and, and development for Saban Brands. And the job was actually for distribution coordinator, which is a very different job. The distribution people are the ones that take the show that's already made and distribute it to everybody else and make sure that the show is dubbed, that all the tapes are where they need to be, that everything's archived properly. It's a very different job. But when I talked to Brian and he told me, you know, we talked about my experience and the position, to his credit, he took a huge chance and he was like, okay, well, let's just change the job. You know, I need I need somebody with me. So I became the production development coordinator. And um, for a long time, it was just me and Brian. And it was a year of just pure hell. And I mean that in the best way possible. But, you know, when you have two people running, you know, not just Power Rangers, but a lot of other, we had Paul Frank, a bunch of other brands. Um, in terms of the, just the creative development of it, it became very crazy. And so, you know, we had to edit together a franchise Bible. I worked with some really cool people on that. We had to, I had to go literally into warehouses full of costumes and identify what the costumes were, figure out which, who belonged to what, like these dusty old things. There was like dead birds in the corner. It was hot. Like it was, it was insane. But, um, but I learned so much and it was right about the time that Samurai first came out. And then um, I was promoted after a few months and then I just kept going. And then my responsibilities kept growing and 
that's kind of how it all happened. So it was really thanks to Brian that I, I got my creative juice back, so to speak, in terms of this industry. It was my first time working for any kids entertainment, which was really interesting. Um, I completely fell in love with the idea of Power Rangers being a good guy in all this crazy entertainment. Like if you'd watched a lot of the Disney shows and the Nickelodeon shows back then that were live action and that were comedies and sitcoms, I noticed a lot of times the kids weren't nice kids. Like um, they're just kind of mean, you know, they're very snarky. They're kind of parents are usually the butt of the joke. And, and I'm like, what is this teaching? kids today you know um no wonder kids are a little jerks sometimes you know and what i loved about power rangers is that was completely the exact opposite like there was um we had these tenants that we always stayed true to which was fitness and teamwork and diversity and all these things and we really wanted to make sure that kids when they were watching power rangers became these were role models for these kids and it, it did really work. And I felt like for me, that's what something that was really special to me as a, as a gay Latina minority female working in an industry that is majority, you know, non-ethnic and non-diverse. It was really cool to see that this that was something that was really important. Yeah, I definitely agree that like growing up with Power Rangers, I know I've said it like a hundred times on the show. If you guys are keeping track at home, take your shots now. Like I grew up with Power Rangers, like Mighty Morphin was the show that came out when I was one year old. And it's been in my life the entire time and you know growing up getting bullied by liking power rangers like i still had these beliefs and these people that i looked up to that i feel have enforced reinforced i should say like who i am in my life and how i go about everything which hasn't ever really steered me wrong so power rangers does have that super beneficial you know group of of people on screen that i think we need more of in some ways. Absolutely. We get to see more of it now a little bit with, you know, the other superheroes, but definitely for 20 some odd years, these guys have been very consistent. (laughs) Yeah. And like the best part is like, you have like such a different group of people, almost every season, everybody has a chance to, you know, enjoy the season and enjoy the people on it. Everyone can be a ranger. Definitely. What, uh, what would you say is one of your favorite memories working over the 10 years with the brand, with Power Rangers? 10 years, that's a lot of memories. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of memories. I mean, it really just depends. I mean, I think it could be anything. I mean, I think, remember, I remember when I first started, the first year I started, there was a licensing show in Las Vegas and um, they wanted to do a flash mob for Power Rangers. And they're like, you have to put together as many Power Ranger suits as you can. Um, so literally it was me and maybe I'd get somebody else coming in, but mostly it was me and a couple of other people were just digging in this warehouse, trying to put together as many suits as we can. And we didn't really even know what was there. Um, and for the most part, we got it done and we ended up, it was getting to the point where like, okay, if we have two of the same Ranger, that's okay. Like we just want as many as we can. Um, I ended up finding a red mystic force helmet, but it turned out to be pink spray painted, but I didn't know that at the time, you know, I was like, looks good enough. And they did this flash bomb during our licensing show summit. And then it came off so well that, um, our president was like, okay, we're going to do it again tomorrow on the floor. Well, at the time we had had 40 some odd dancers in Las Vegas who were done. I mean, that was their contract one day. So we had to, at the last minute, you know, we had four guys, including Yoshi. Yoshi was one of the stunt guys at the time. On their way back from LA, we had to turn them around. They were gonna, but we turn them to go come back to Vegas. We had to hire 40 more dancers in less than a day, teach them the routine, and then figure out how we're gonna do it on the floor. And we did it. <laughs> it was amazing. I remember the choreographer who was amazing. He was so fun. He got to be the red ranger and he loved it because he it was the power ranger with the cape so if you actually watch the videos online you see him like holding the cape and like just loving the hell out of it it was amazing i mean it is stuff like that i think um when you really i think when it all works you know there's so many things that we do that people just don't see and they only see the end result and sometimes it's just you know where you have to say trust us guys i promise we got this um hyperforce was one of those things where it first got announced and people were like i have no idea what this is is this a game is this a show like well, what is it and it was kind of like when it came together and when people started to realize what an amazing unique thing 
it was. It was really satisfying and fulfilling for me, especially since I was there uh, every episode. I was lucky. I got to really interact with the fans in that way that I didn't get to on the other stuff. Um, the comic books are also something really special. When we went to WonderCon and we had issue 25, which was going to kick off the first uh, the first issue of Shattered Grid. And we handed out the issue to the audience and let them read it. And that issue, Tommy dies, spoiler alert. And you actually see the fans' faces. I think those are probably some of my favorite moments. When you, you know, as cool as it is to work on this stuff and hold these props in your hands and, and do all this stuff by yourself in a room, it's when you see the work from the other perspective that I think it gets really special because it makes it feel worth it. I was there for WonderCon. That was a really powerful moment. Like you could just feel different parts of the room that reached the end. And you, yeah, and I was going really slow with mine, and I just like felt like everybody in my right just, oh, yeah. Poor Kyle thought we, they were gonna kill him. Yeah. He was so afraid. It was great. It was great. Um, the cons are one of my favorite favorite memories because I did get to meet the fans that way, and um, I was never a brand ambassador. That wasn't my job. My job was to be a development and production person and to make sure that the product that came out was the best product possible, but. Um, when I got to meet those fans, that was always really special for me. There's so many people that have so many, you know, vocal voices in the community that have just such praise for the show and where the show is headed and what everything that has been done these past few years is really going to, I think, push it farther than it could ever have gone. I hope so. Yeah. So obviously with a brand like this, with all the work that goes into Power Rangers, all of the just different, you know, venues of entertainment that Power Rangers does and brings, what was your process for, like, let's start with the show, for instance. Like, what was your process when, you know, it started from this Japanese show and then moving it into something like Samurai or, you know... Um, it's always one big team effort. It's not, it's never just one person. I mean, we absolutely have a showrunner who puts together the show and does it amazingly well. We have Chip Lynn and his amazing team of writers and producers and um, people in New Zealand. And so he takes care of the actual execution of the show itself. Um, in terms of the way something like that happens, that's a bond. I can't speak to Hasbro because I don't, I still have an NDA. <laughs> but the way it worked at Saban was um, essentially you just, you know, you have your your CP teams, the people that work on consumer products. You've got your president, you've got your, all your different teams, the business affairs teams, the Power Rangers team, everybody that comes together and talks about what is going to be the proper season to work out? You work with your, at the time we worked with Bandai, and then we worked with Hasbro. What is the best, uh, what is the best for toys? What does the footage look like? What does, you know, what would that mean for casting? What about locations? What can we do? Um, and eventually everybody kind of comes to an agreement as to what they think the best show is going to be. And that's the show that it is. Um, so a lot of times, usually you'll have the, um, the executive producer and the writer scrubbing the footage and being like, here's our recommendation. We come up with a recommendation. There's just a lot of discussion, a lot of teamwork. And then when it comes to actually working on the show itself, obviously, you know, Chip at that point would, would take the lead on making sure that the casting is working. Um, once we get everybody cast, um, again, always input from, from the bigger team, but you know, it's chip show. Once the casting is done, then, you know, then it becomes at the same time you're working on development of the actual show. A lot of times you're just not, you're not focused on the footage at that time. You're just focused on what is the show going to be because, um, every showrunner is going to have a different way of they, how they approach an adaptation. In, in this respect, it's always based on what's the best story for that particular theme. Um, if the theme was Dino Charge, what is that going to look like, right? Obviously, it's dinosaurs. How do you incorporate dinosaurs into this? Make it feel cool. Make it feel uh, unique and interesting. Uh, what's the set going to look like? How does that inform the set? How does that inform the toys? You'll often have, you know, the people, the CP people being like, well, we'd really love to include a blaster this season. It's not in the footage. How do we do that? Um, that's how you end up with things like cockpit mode where, um, they're like, we'd really love something else. We don't have an upgrade this season. What can we do? Okay. Well, there's a special, you know, we're going to reshoot the cockpit footage for a, B and C. Maybe we can do something there. Um, so it really is really dependent at that point. Then you really start looking at what's in the footage. You're going to start listing out all the elements and all the characters. So here's this character, here's this weapon, here's this monster. There's a whole sheet that tells you like, here's the episode, here's where it comes, blah, 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 blah. And then there is where you decide um, 
how it's going to go and what toys are going to be featured and what we have time for because you know we have uh 44 episodes uh, over two seasons but you're not going to have time for everything and then you also have to really take into account the adaptability of the footage as well um because japanese broadcasting standards are very different than american broadcasting standards there's just things that are just not going to be acceptable like for example samurai um shinkinger at the time there was an episode where they're sacrificing virgins down a well not going to work for us right i think in the, <laughs> i think they had they were sacrificing toys <laughs> or something yeah. you know, but little stuff like that um i worked on digimon fusion too um and glitter force um and it was kind of the same thing that was much harder because it was all animation we weren't shooting anything right. um but i remember digimon fusion they actually had a character um i think it was lilith mon where she fused with somebody else and then she ended up with talking boobs and a talking crotch um and literally we had to have people go in and paint it all out because just it's just not gonna air you know that's just not gonna be acceptable so it's a lot of different factors that go in then the scripts start getting written and um and then you start shooting and you it's the same way that karen talked about where you have two units and you have your sets it's the same thing you just film it all and then the magic comes in post you know because everything you see all those special effects those have to come in so you start creating your rough cuts your producer cuts your studio cuts everything else and, and you work with the um with the executive producers and the music composers and everybody to get it out the door but um the, the tv shows themselves um i didn't really start contributing creatively until i want to say maybe a little bit dino charge beast morphery um but i was working on the other stuff for the most part for the tv show up until those last couple seasons because i was getting promoted gotcha so if we wanted to look at the other side of that so while you were working on the show you know kind of moving your way up through that you said that you also worked on the 2017 power ranger movie i did yeah i did um so that was a co-production with lionsgate with an amazing group of people um there was just discussion as to there was always interest in the movie lionsgate was just the one that we ended up going with because they had done some amazing work already um so essentially i just i was able to fortunate to work with in the development of the film so it just uh, it's the way any development works you know you you meet with the executives you meet with writers you decide on the take you work on the take you work on the cuts and all that fun stuff so i mean it really it's not any different the way any other video uh, movie was done but what was exciting about power rangers 2017 movie is that we were building for a different audience this was going to be a, an older audience so there was a lot more freedom all original footage there was a lot more freedom in what the story we wanted to do was um and our director was just so passionate about power rangers and the story he wanted to tell and that was really fun um one of my favorite days was actually being able to go to set and, and see it all come together that was really cool what was the energy like um working towards that picture like knowing that you're going to basically be remaking mighty Morphin power rangers and how a lot of people are very passionate about you know that season and kind of the the challenges i mean it's one of those things where um it was even the decision to are we remaking more and more from power rangers or are we just telling a brand new story um it really it gets you power rangers itself has i would say and this is not definitive this is just my take obviously um i would say maybe three or four different audiences really you have the kid audience the kids who are watching Power Rangers, most of the time, this is the first superhero genre that they are really, truly passionate about. Um, they usually three to five to six, then maybe about six to seven, they're moving on to like Marvel, Star Wars, blah, 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 blah. But not all kids, right? Some people fall in love with Power Rangers and stay with Power Rangers. And those are our super fans, right? You're going to have the, the, the fans that, you know, fell in love with Power Rangers at whatever season they fell in love with it and just are now still passionate, still hoping to interact with the brand, still finding a way to relate to it in some way. And then you've got the casual audience, which is the ones that only remember Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Like there is no other ranger. Like um, if you see Power Rangers in a parade, they're gonna be like, where's the green one? If there's no green ranger, because all they remember is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Those are three very different audiences. And the challenge with the television show is that it's a very young show. And it's meant to capture this young audience, but when the audience grows out, there's nowhere for them 
to go to not engage with the brand. Rebooting Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, from my perspective, again, I'm not speaking to anybody else's, seemed like the best bet just because it's a nice way to satisfy everyone. This, this three quadrants that you're working with where you have the casuals who only remember Power Rangers. So this is a way to try and get them in the theaters. The older fans who may be tired of Power Rangers, but might be interested in another way of engaging with it, hopefully might hang on to find other, another way to go into it. And the younger kids who may not know Power Rangers, but their parents are into that and still like Power Rangers. And so um, that that's, that's the first hurdle you have to overcome. What's the take? What's the story? And to do that, you have to meet with a bunch of different writers um, who each come in and tell you, here's what I'm thinking. Um, before you even do that, you have to meet with a director. You know, what? what's the director's take? Oftentimes you'll meet with a writer. Um, and this is me working on multiple movies. Like if you meet with a writer, you're going to have to eventually meet with the director. And what if the director comes in and you've already got a script and he wants to throw the whole script away? Then he brings in his own writer. So it's, it is a meeting of the minds. The challenge for something like this is that not everybody is coming in with 10 years Power Rangers experience. Right. So it becomes an education process as well as, you know, how far up my own butt do I have to be to be like, no, that's not Power Rangers. And I, you know, truly have to listen to everybody else because they are the audience, right? We need more than just the, just the fan audience to watch this movie if we're going to make a movie. If we're talking about Mighty Morphin, obviously for the movie for 2017, going with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was, you know, a proper good choice for that. The comics, I was really surprised when those first started coming out, because if you're not familiar with the Boom Studios comics, they... You should be reading them, yeah. Yeah, definitely. They did a retelling of the Mighty Morphin series, kind of from the point where Tommy enters the group, the Green Ranger enters the group, and sort of his not really fitting in not really meshing because if you watched the show he's he was evil they turned him good and it's a really interesting point to start and then they did another series that was from the beginning where all five of the originals become the heroes yeah and so you worked on the comics what exactly was your process what did you do through that um i was the um i was the suit <laughs> <laughs> no, essentially, um, I worked very closely with the comic books. Um, Ryan and Kyle and Marguerite and all those, and Daphna, the editor, um, worked really closely with all of them. Essentially, I was just uh, the power, the de facto Power Rangers expert and creative. So um, whether it was just me by the end or if there was a group of us, essentially the whole point was, you know, we were the approvals. So essentially how it eventually started is we had done comic books before. We had done them with paper cuts, but paper cuts was kind of going for that younger audience. Um, so there were good stories, but they were one shots. There was comic books told back, you know, in the day with like Zeo and Marvel. And I think Europe was still doing these comic books, these two pagers, but nobody had ever really approached Power Rangers uh, with this idea of we're going to tell Power Rangers for this older audience. We're going to really, we think it's there. And Boom really embraced that. Boom Studios, they kind of have this amazing way of telling stories. They have Lumberjanes, they have Big Trouble Little China, they have Adventure Time, they got Buffy. Like they really want to take these stories and retell them in a way that is modern and unique. And Kyle Higgins, uh, the first writer of MMPR, he once said um, something that really stuck with me. He's like, I'm not telling Power Rangers as it was, which was young and a little cheesy and, you know, not serialized. It's like, I'm telling it the way I remember it making me feel. So, and I think that's a really good distinction because I think a lot of people, and um, there was a, there was that Eddie Shanker series, that Eddie Shanker short that was very NC-17 rated R Grizzly Power Ranger reboot. And I feel like a lot of people um, automatically, that's what they feel like Power Rangers needed to be um, at the time, you know, in order to connect with a larger audience. You need to grow it up. It needs to be, you know, an R rated series. I think I agreed with Kyle and that, no, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> you know, you can take power rangers and everything about what makes power rangers great is its innate goodness and the fact that people don't give up and it's good versus evil and it's about you know being your best version of yourself when there's a lot of conflict and a lot of loss along the way and um and kyle really embraced that and this essentially what it would happen was 
you know, there usually be some sort of story summit. We'd all be getting a room. We'd talk about what the story is going to be. Then Kyle would present a pitch um, that was vetted by their team. And then we would give our thoughts. Um, and then it would just keep going. Then you'd get a script. Then you'd get an outline. Then you'd get a proof. Uh, then you'd get designs. And so it was just giving feedback every step of the way to make sure that the, the issues were on brand that there weren't any um, continuity issues, that everything felt the same. And then a part of my job was also to make sure it's like, OK, you guys are doing this cool thing. Well, the TV show is doing this, or Hyperforce is doing this, or Legacy Wars is doing this. How can we seed it all together to make it all work together? Mm -hmm. The books probably were a lot of times the favorite part of my day, though, because there was no budget. There's no. There's no worrying about how you're going to pull this off in live action. It's literally pie as the sky. And it's dangerous to have that kind of freedom because I feel like you could very easily veer off into something that fans will reject. And we've had a couple controversial pushes in that direction. But I feel like for the most part, um, fans have really embraced what we're trying to do, which is tell Power Rangers in a way that fills in some blanks that maybe the fans felt was missing. Um, like the idea of, you know, Tommy shows up, he tries to kill them for five episodes, and then the next episode, everything's cool. Well, no, I mean, that wouldn't really be, I mean, that works for a kid's show, right? But it's not how real life works, right? Mm -hmm. So you tell that story in between of him struggling with this PTSD, of the Rangers having to struggle, like, dude, this guy tried to kill us. And yeah, Kimberly, you want him to be your boyfriend, whatever, but like, he still tried to kill us. Like, what are we gonna do? And kind of Gogo kind of went in that same direction. So once Mighty Morphin became really solidified itself with this big mythological, crazy, groundbreaking stuff, we wanted to tell quieter stories. And so Boom came to us with this, we want to tell a second series we want to tell it and we're uh we want to tell it to be smaller it's when the group first started without tommy because tommy took so much of that first seat that first 30 issues or whatever mm -hmm. we want to make this about the original five and so it was kind of a cw approach to power rangers these are five teenagers with hormones with attitudes struggling to embrace their powers and figure out what it all means and uh we brought ryan on for that and ryan parrot amazing at character amazing um we first met ryan when uh boom hired him to do aftershock which was the one shot graphic novel for the movie and i just felt so bad for ryan because he literally he had to come in read the script and then go off and write a, a write a uh, comic book but he couldn't change anything and he couldn't do anything too crazy he couldn't introduce anything insane because who knows what's going to happen in the future and to tell, try to tell an 80 page story with those kind of constraints where the characters have to start and stop at the same time. How do you tell a compelling story? And he did it. And it really impressed me. Um, and a lot, he impressed a lot of people, obviously, because he went on to write Gogo. And Gogo has some of my favorite stories um, in it because they're just all character based. He really takes the characters and really looks at them to find out what makes them tick. And he takes little nuts and pieces. You know, we started to see background, the background of uh, Rita and of Goldar and Squat. And you got to see, you know, Kimberly having a crush on Jason, which I really loved. Um, you got to see some really interesting stuff, Bulk and, you know, Skull and Billy being BFFs on their kids and growing apart and never really repairing that friendship. That's all stuff that happens. And I feel like it made Power Rangers relatable in a way um, that we hadn't seen before. Definitely. Speaking of other things that aren't necessarily for kids, let's move on to Hyperforce. Hyperforce. Yeah. So if you guys aren't familiar with Hyperforce, it was a tabletop RPG um, sort of serial, like where, you know, they did episodes, they did, you know, stories that they followed through, but they had, you know, five different actors and characters playing these, these rangers on a new official Power Ranger team called Power Rangers Hyperforce. Yeah, Hyperforce was fantastic. Um, I was actually, I'm honestly, my mind boggles that we we're able to even get it, get it done, but that speaks a lot to the amazing people at Saban Brands who were willing to take a chance and immediately understood what we were trying to do. Um, Hyperforce came about because um, Bischoff, uh, his, her wi his wife was on a show at on Hyper RPG and they wanted to pitch us a show. So um, 
so so Zach and Malika came in and said we wanted to do a Power Rangers RPG and I I knew what a RPG was because I worked with a couple of actors on Glitter Force that did critical roles so I knew that kind of situation but we thought it was cool and we liked um we liked the idea again we were look we were looking for ways to engage the audience that was not maybe feeling satisfied by the TV show and Hyperforce felt like a perfect way to tell a story where budget was not in the cards. If you tell a story, you can tell that a 24 Megazord or, you know, a hundred foot Megazord is coming and squashing the entire village. You don't have to film that. You just, you know, the audience just has to experience that. Um, we ended up with amazing cast. Um, at around the same time was we were developing Hyperforce, Peter uh, came to me, Peter, who was Ninja Steel Blue, and Yoshi, their brothers, they came to me because um, we became really good friends and they are big D&D players. And so they said, we want to make a D&D, a Power Rangers D&D show. And I was like, well, funny you should say that. We're kind of working on something right now. Um, so we can't do yours, <laughs> but we can bring you on ours. <laughs> and so basically the way it would work was we would, um, we had a general story arc in mind. And the week before uh, Malika and Cameron would come up, would give me like a write up of this is what the episode should look like. And it was just basically two or three paragraphs. And then I would look at it and give my thoughts um, and notes. We'd adjust accordingly. And then we'd take it to my boss. He'd sign off of it on it. And then Malika would not send the story to the actors, but just send points, story points. Like, you know, if this happens, think about doing this, blah, 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 blah. So the, what you ended up with was a hybrid of a show and an RPG. So there's just, and I think that's when the magic really started to happen because we had that fan element, that fan interaction where people are responding in real time to what they're seeing. And they're able to contribute to the play style because they could, you know, buy dice and extra rolls and that'll help the team. And um, it was it was terrifying for me. But in the end, I I kind of had to eat my own words because the cast, what was super special about it was that they really did become those rangers. They knew what being a ranger was and they acted accordingly to the point where it even surprised us. Like we never had to worry about them being not a ranger because in their heads, they knew what a ranger was. They knew what it meant to be a ranger and they took it really seriously. I I, I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't fully finished uh, Hyperforce, but I think I am, after this interview, going to go sit down and rewatch as much of it as I can. I mean, it's three hours long. It's yeah. a trek. And I say that as me being there every week. It was. It can be long. Just read the wiki if you want, and then give it a watch. <laughs> Just go for your favorite episodes. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. I'll take your word for that one. Let's move on to the last kind of sort of big project that you worked on with Power Rangers, uh, you know, versus the show, the movie, the comics even this internet variety tabletop show, Battle for the Grid, a video game, yeah. Power Rangers. Tell, tell us about that. Um, so Enway had already done a uh, game with us before, which was Power Rangers Legacy Wars. So I knew those guys very, very well. Um, we launched Legacy Wars together. I was very involved with Legacy Wars. I uh, helped figure out which Rangers went to show up. We're gonna, I helped you know with the creative in terms of what the creative was gonna look like for the show, for the game. Um, and so a deal was made that they were going to do a console game. And so um, it became a, a challenge of how do we how do we make this different from Legacy Wars? Um, this is going to be a PvP fighting game like Marvel, you know, Marvel Capcom. But how do we really how do we really engage the fans who we know are going to want more? And so when it came to the story mode, that's when I really was involved. So the decision was made to add a story mode. Um, this was before the game even launched. Um, then the idea was, okay, what's the story mode going to be like? We can only start with so many characters. So we need to be able to include all of these characters. We have 10 slots and we have to create, you know, a story mode that's so long with fights in between. Um, and so I brought Kyle back on board for that. So Kyle had done an amazing job on Shattered Grid with Ryan. And I'm like, I loved the story of Shattered Grid. Um, I knew that it would um, resonate for a casual audience as well, because, you know, Tommy's a, a big figure. 
people love an evil ranger and it gave us a chance to include the entire franchise of rangers we're not just stuck in one era yeah you start in mighty morphin but then you see all these other rangers and that's kind of what we wanted to do fixing the wheel that isn't broken we wanted to just retell uh shattered grid in a really fun uh way and so we brought kyle so we did a summit in san francisco for a day and we basically hashed it all out we're like here are the 10 characters that we have like okay you want a tank here's this here's that it was uh me um producer from Lionsgate, Kyle, the the director is at Enway. We were just all in a room, just hashing it all out. And from there, we were able to, you know, we brought in Dan Mora to do some of the art. We had, um, we were able to, at the last minute, figure out a way to add voices so that we could have these voices. And we brought in Jason David Frank and Austin St. John and David Fielding and Kerrigan, where he's even able to do gold art. And we had some amazing voice actors to fill in and supplement. Um, we had a very limited budget, so I had to do a couple of the voices, <laughs> but we got it done. And at the end, we ended up with a story mode that I thought was really fun and, and worth playing. So um, I'm glad people liked it. I just want to thank you for all of the work that you've done for Power Rangers, for the brand, to push it into the future, to push it to where it is. Um, I think I speak for many fans in this fandom as well. Thank you so much for everything that you've done with it. Of course. Um, I think, you know, it's just the beginning for Power Rangers. Obviously, I'm not there anymore, but there's people that are still uh, with Hasbro who are very passionate about the brand. Definitely. And I hope there are people that are on board or who become on board who can make their dreams like this happen. Like someone who may be a super fan right now could potentially work on a show like this, could push it and elevate it even higher somehow. I don't I don't know how they're going to do that, but that's a, yeah. that's up for you guys to figure out. But that's all the time that we have on this show. I do have one last question for you. Okay. If there was no budget, if there was no Sentai footage constraints, what would a Power Rangers show, if there was no producers, no, you know, like real limits, what kind of show would you want to make or see? Like a theme or... Um, this is the first time I've said this. <laughs> I wouldn't do live action. Um, I would reserve live action for a primetime series and for a, um, a feature film series. I would go animated. I would do an animated reboot um, and I would do it so that we're just with a brand new continuity. I think might be really holding a lot of fans back is that, you know, you have 25 seasons of kind of a slipshoddy continuity. You know, some people have tried to make it work. Some people have just said, what's a Power Ranger over and over again. And, but I mean, Star Wars did it to a point. Marvel's done it. Everybody's done it to a point. I think at some point we're just going to have to start fresh and allow people that maybe haven't discovered Power Rangers who, who have that be a, a gateway. That's a gateway for them really interesting them. We can still love everything we've done, um, at least until technology catches up for us to the point that we're not relying on footage. Um, because I think the world is a lot smaller now. And I think the, especially the super fans that are watching Power Rangers, the majority of them are watching Sentai already. Yeah, it's fun. It's absolutely fun to to think about what could be adapted and what's coming. But for me, it'd be a lot more fun to not know what's coming. But I definitely think for the younger audience to be able to do more um, animated would be the way to go. Awesome. Well, that's all that we have for this episode of Let's Talk Tokyo. I want to thank you one more time for giving us an hour and really kind of unloading a lot of information that I think I'm going to have to unpack maybe another watch or two of this. There's, there's, there's just so much there that I'm so I'm so happy that we had this moment. Yeah, of course, man. Thank you for having me. Of course. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. That's all that we have for Let's Talk Toku. We will see you all on the next episode. Bye.